So it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this week's uh, Oxford Centre for Tropical Forest Seminar. And our guest speaker is Katarina Sam from the, uh, 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 from, from the Czech Republic, from the uh, uh, Czech Academy of Sciences. I don't know the full affiliation now. Uh, it was the uh, Entomology Institute of Biology at the Centre of the Czech Academy of Sciences. And Katarina did her PhD in Ornithology at the University of South Bohemia uh, for work in Papua New Guinea. And then she did a postdoc with Roger Kitching in the University of Brisbane in Australia and then returned to the Czech Republic. And she's a holder of a prestigious ERC starting grant uh, on the topic that you'll hear about uh, today. So thank you for joining us, Katrina, over to you. Thank you very much for invitation and welcome everyone. And uh, I will share the screen now, should work like this. Is that okay? That's good. Okay, wonderful. So hello everyone. Uh, as it was announced today, I will speak about uh, the trophic cascades in the forests. And my questions are whether the predators protect the forest canopies. Uh, despite it, it's autumn now and all the canopies are yellowish, we uh, might recall that our world is actually green. And this might be thanks to the bottom-up control, which is uh, actually the perspective that uh, emphasizes the disgustness and the protection of the plants and the amount of biomass uh, in the plants protecting, protecting themselves effectively. But the other perspective might be the top-down control, which emphasizes that there are the predators who feed on the herbivorous insect, thus they are allowing the plants to flourish. This hypothesis is a little bit long, uh, older, uh, published in 1960s only, and it has been very controversial at the beginning, but it started, uh, it resulted into the uh, good work and uh, lots of publications on this topic. And now we can see that the truth might be somewhere in the middle. And we have actually various habitats and various types of the green, shades of the green in our world, which are shaped by the bottom up and top down control at the same time. So over the evolutionary race between the arthropods and plants, the plants developed various types of defenses. Some of them are constitutive and these defenses are always present in the trees. Uh, thus they are very useful for the situations when the arthropods are abundant and they attack the plants very often. Uh, otherwise, we have also the protection which is induced, and this is uh, started in the plants only after the plant is attacked by herbivorous arthropods. And this uh, protection is useful for these situations when the attacks are not expected in time or they are very rare. Uh, when we are looking deeper into the induced defenses, we might split them into the direct ones and indirect ones. The direct ones are aimed against the arthropods directly, killing them or making the plants disgusting so the arthropods leave. And the indirect defenses actually work through the predators. The herbivores feeding on the plants are starting the chemical uh, pathways in the plants, releasing the chemical and maybe also visual signals to the predators or parasitoids, and these come uh, they come, they feed on the arthropods, helping thus the plant to survive. We might uh, therefore expect a trade-off between the direct and indirect defenses. You can imagine that if the plant itself is very well protected by the constitutive defenses, there is only few arthropods surviving, feeding on them, and thus the plant itself can be producing only very weak signal to the predators. But when the defenses of the trees itself are uh, very weak, then there is so many arthropods feeding on them. And uh, this tree thus can signal very strongly to the predators. Thus there might be the trees or plant species depended more on the predators or more on the uh, constitutive defenses. But when we are talking about the top-down control, and the predators, who are actually the most important predators. 
we might think that the big animals like birds, maybe insectivorous birds are eating a lot. Or we might think along the way of the biomass, their global biomass. And in that way, many people believe that the ants are the most uh, effective uh, predators in the many of the forest ecosystems. There are also studies showing that the spider should not be neglected when we are considering who runs the tropic cascades. Uh, one study was showing that maybe the spiders and birds are actually uh, consuming the same amount of insect per year, somewhere between 400 to 800 million tons of insect annually. And uh, when we are looking into which predators are important, we might equally ask where do they eat the most and when do the cascades from the predators through the arthropods trans uh, cascade all the way down to the plants. The traditional view is, is that the terrestrial uh, tropic cascades are the strongest in tropics or at the low elevations where the productivity is the highest. And uh, Oxanen's hypothesis was specifically saying that the top-down control varies as the function of productivity. This is quite an old view, but the coming reviews which were published much later we're showing that this might not be the truth. The tropic cascades were recorded to be the strongest at the extremes and the most productive and the least productive habitats, but also uh, only in the temperate regions. This might be simply because the predation is very difficult to study and it's very difficult to study the whole tropic cascades. So when we start with the predation as such, we have several ways how to study that. The predation, unfortunately, is the process which is very fast. It usually happens above your head, somewhere in the foliage where you can't see the predator and you can't see what the predator ate. So there are indirect ways how, the, how we can uh, explore, uh, expose some baits uh, on which we document whether the predator took it or not. This might be a fly larvae or some tuna baits or something which attracts the predator and we measure whether the bait was gone or not. Another method is the method with the plasticine caterpillars. This has slight advantage because you can recall from the bites on the caterpillar who was the predator, whether it was arthropod or whether it was bird or lizard. But unfortunately, the caterpillars are not very similar to the real prey. They don't smell exactly the same way. They look different. So the, another way how to study the predation and effect of predators might be the exclusion of predators. This means that you build the cages or some other barriers in the forest and you prevent the access of the predators to the study system. And later on, you count what is the difference between the herbivory or between the communities of the insect left on the foliage. So uh, let's start with the first method. There, I was very lucky to be a part of the global study where uh, my colleagues uh, exposed the caterpillars in various habitats across the globe. I was uh, surveying for them study site in Czech Republic, Papua, and in Australia. And there, we observed that most of the plasticine caterpillars were attacked in the tropics and at the lowest elevations. And most of the attacks were caused by the arthropod predators like ants. This study didn't find any effect of uh, a latitudinal or altitudinal effect uh, in the predation by birds. And generally the predation by birds on the plasticine caterpillars was very low. I always believed it might be because the plasticine caterpillars were presented very low, only one meter above uh, ground. And I was wondering whether these results from the plasticine caterpillars actually match the results from the exclusion experiments. And therefore, I started to study, uh, survey the various predator exclosures. I found 475 experiments so far, there are still new appearing. And I focused on the studies where ants were excluded by some sticky barriers or some fine netting and the vertebrates or birds and bats individually were excluded by uh, cages. 
And when we are, uh, this is, uh, these are my results, which I found uh, from all these studies. And I found that when the vertebrate predators, birds and bats together were excluded, the arthropod abundances always increased significantly. This is here. But when the ants were excluded, the effect was not significant. Uh, the line was touching the no effect uh, line, and thus we didn't detect in this uh, review any effect of ants. But when I split the data into the effect of the predators on predatory and herbivore arthropods, I saw quite an interesting thing. It looks that the birds and uh, vertebrate predators were feeding equally on the predatory and herbivore arthropods, while the ants seem to be affecting effecti uh, effectively only the herbivore arthropods. And uh, this actually, to my surprise, translated into the lower trophic level to the plant damage. So the ants feeding mostly on the art herbivore arthropods, then uh, it led to the higher uh, herbivores damage when the ants were missing. Uh, this was not happening with the exclusion of vertebrate predators, where the vertebrate predators were feeding on both guilds equally, thus the trophic cascades kind of deleted each other and didn't happen and was not detected. Uh, along the latitudinal gradient and elevational gradient, we didn't find any strong effect. Uh, they, there might be Low, a little one in the exclusion of ants, but nothing strong in the abundances of arthropods. But uh, this is the picture for herbivory where the effect was quite detectable, visible here in the ants uh, exclusions. But doing this review, I found that the exclusion experiments which are existing now are not very comparable. They differ a lot in the methods used and they significantly uh, differ in the scale and in the length of the experiment. And we found that the le length of the experiment specifically is having significant effect on the results. And because not many people is doing these exclusions uh, repeatedly on several sites, I identified that this is a real uh, gap in what we are missing to answer the questions. So I first decided to do my uh, first experiment along the elevation gradient. And I decided to do it uh, in Papua New Guinea, where I was previously working for my PhD on the bird communities. And uh, I worked along my favorite elevation gradient of Mount Wilhelm, which uh, is mountain, the highest mountain of the country, reaching up to 4,509 meters, but having the tree line at 3,700 meters above sea level. Along this gradient, we already uh, set eight research stations, small camps, where we were surveying the birds, and they are 500 meters elevational apart. And uh, this is how the elevation gradient looks like from the middle. There is a tree line at 3,700 meters. We are standing with my assistant at 2,700 meters, and there is about 15 kilometers down to the foothill of this range. Along the elevational gradient of Mount Wilhelm, the habitat differed significantly. There is a very high canopy forest with very dense, dark understory. And at the tree line, the trees are quite uh, scare, uh, scattered uh, with the open canopy and very dense understory. Also, the temperature decreases significantly from the mean 25 degrees per day in the lowlands to about seven degrees per day at the highest elevational study site, which results into very different communities of predators. For example, the ants are not present above 2,700 meters above sea level. And uh, as uh, I, at the time, enjoyed the work with the plasticine a lot, I first started again with the experiment with the plasticine caterpillars. This time I was actually asking slightly different question, whether the herbivory manually uh, made herbivory and the plants attract the predators. But uh, here we can see also the trend, how the caterpillars were attracted, uh, attracted and attacked by the different predators. So the attacks of the ants decreased with the increasing elevation, while the 
uh, attacks by birds were kind of low plateau or uh, quite high in the lowlands, but then decreasing also steeply, but not so steeply as ants. And there was actually more attacks by birds in the mid elevations and higher elevations than the attacks of ants. And I thought this is okay because it corresponded well with the abundances uh, of both predators. But I wanted to do what happens if I remove these predators from the study system. Oh, pardon. Uh, so I started to do my treatments. I have got the saplings, which were control ones, to which I didn't do anything. Then the saplings from which I excluded ants by the sticky barriers. And then the vertebrate treatment, where I excluded both birds and bats uh, together by cages placed around the saplings permanently for six months. And then I have got a combined treatment where I, where I was excluding uh, by the cages the vertebrates and I covered everything in glue uh, to prevent the access of the ants also. And finally, I have got those two tricky treatments where I wanted to remove the birds and bats separately because this is not what has been done many times. It's quite challenging because we had to have the cages which we were pulling up every day in the morning and in the afternoon to allow the specific predators in or keep them out. So we were hanging, uh, we were hanging the cages to the canopy, we were shooting the ropes up there and then pulling the cages up several times a day. Actually, my assistants were doing that because I had put my first baby at the time, so I was navigating them how to do it. And this is kind of how the tangle glue was uh, applied on the trunks. And my assistants distributed many kilometers of the water piping along the elevational gradient and many kilometers of fishing nets to prevent the access of predators. And as I already mentioned, the experiment was six and six months old, uh, long. So after the six months, after the end of the wet season, we for the first time uh, spread the crowns of the saplings with the mortain, fast knockdown insecticide, and collected all the arthropods which we, had, which we could see. And we also collected 30 leaves per sapling. Uh, later on, we uh, uh, collected, like the six months later, we collected all the leaves and whole sapling which we actually cut down and to the whole, whole foliage down. The herbivory analysis is actually a work which uh, surprised me <laughs> a lot because to measure the herbivory correctly, we needed to number the leaves and survey how the herbivory changed. So we had uh, photos of the leaves at the beginning, then measuring the holes in the image and the Photoshop, and then we scanned the leaves and compared them from the herbivory at the beginning. And we have got many leaves to do. And at the same time, we also kept surveying the predators, what they eat, what the communities look like, and how many insectivores is actually be living there. And when we get to the results, these are the graphs I plotted recently. Here, the elevation is treated as the continuous variable, and the model is kind of fitting the lines, how the effect of the predators look like. So you can see at the bottom the green, black line, which is showing the control saplings. Then actually uh, not significantly different from it is the end treatment. And then uh, significantly different from both these treatments is the effect of all predators excluded and the vertebrates excluded. The effect was overall always uh, lower in the dry season. You can see that the dots are a little bit less scattered and less variable because there was simply lower abundance of the arthropods altogether during the dry season. And uh, this is a total uh, abundance of the arthropods. When we are looking a little bit deeper into which predators were actually affected, uh, we can see the different orders of the arthropods. And starting from my favorite one, the spiders. Spiders were affected uh, significantly by all predators. This means that when the predators were gone, the abundances of spiders increased significantly. 
they seem to be fitting into the three niches which we uh, made. But also, there is a significant difference between the treatment of uh, tr where the ants were excluded and where the only vertebrates were excluded, which means that if the ants were missing either in all or ant treatment, there was more spiders suddenly. You can see similarly that uh, other uh, orders affected uh, by birds mainly were beetles. Diptera were not affected by anything. Similarly, the Hemiptera, Hymenoptera were actually kind of uh, decreasing their abundances when the predators were gone, especially when the ants were gone. And uh, the Lepidoptera were again rather increasing their abundances significantly when the vertebrates were gone, but also a little bit uh, significant, nearly significantly when the all predators and ants were gone. Again, similarly the effect on all other predators which I lumped together. So I quite like this uh, result. Uh, it's showing me in more detail what's actually happening. And uh, you can see on the scale here that the increase of the arthropods actually was usually like two to three times here, the minus two means that the abundance is increased, increased five times. So uh, quite, quite a big increase. But uh, I also like that this result is very much in line with what we found earlier from the diet. Uh, this graph is actually quite messy, but uh, I would like to show only the yellow color standing out, which are the spiders consumed by birds. Uh, there we were sequencing the vomit of the birds which we were collecting as well as visually identifying and by both methods we identified big proportion of the spiders in the birds diet and uh, the other taxa were a little bit less abundant. Many birds were of course uh, fully frugivorous. So the spiders represent in total about 18% of the birds intake and the herbivores versus predators, roughly 50%. And uh, when we are looking, uh, because I really uh, started to like the spiders, I was also plotting how the proportion of spiders themselves changed in the relation to the other insects in the sample. So uh, this graph is actually showing the mean proportion of the spiders in the sample. The gray area is how the control looked like, and the lines are for the individual treatments. So where the vertebrates were missing, not too much was actually happening, exactly as we have seen on the earlier graph, but the abundances uh, of the spiders increased significantly. Again, the same results as before, just seen different way when the ants were gone. So there seems to be a competition between the spiders, uh, spiders and ants. So the, when, they, when we exclude the ants, the spiders very quickly, um, but maybe not so quickly, are getting in and taking the free niche. The other aspects of the arthropod communities affected by our treatments was the body size. Uh, bigger insects were surviving where the arthropods were missing. These are the similar graphs, again, the same treatments where the vertebrates cages were present by the pink and the yellow. The mean body size of the arthropods surviving were bigger. And on this graph, it's slightly different. You can see that when the birds had access to the branches, then only, only the bigger uh, predate, uh, arthropods were surveying on this end of the graph. Similarly, my student is uh, analyzing similar data set from also Papua New Guinea, but from different study sites, from fragments, uh, primary forest, primary forest at the higher elevation and secondary forest. And similarly, the same way at each of these study sites, the chewing tours and the arthropods, which have no relationship to herbivory, those which are the most eaten, are increasing their uh, body sizes significantly in the predator exclusions. Uh, I should not forget that we were also doing those tricky treatments. And here I have to admit that we failed a bit 
we were unfortunately not able to do the treatments at each of the study sites because there are no people living and the assistants didn't want to stay there for so long and works every day for me. So we had to do it at the study sites where uh, villages were nearby. So we ended up with four elevational study sites only. And uh, the results are quite messy. This is a very rough graph where the elevation is treated as a factor, so it might not be definite. But uh, we can definitely say that against the expectation, the effect of birds and bats is not additive. The abundances of the insects increase at some of the study sites significantly, but sometimes it's because the bats seem to be most important uh, predators at the site, and sometimes the birds seem to be eating the most. So my student Elise Vod is still working and trying to match the diet of the bats and diet of the birds specifically with this result at these four study sites. But uh, again, not definite, definitely not additive effect. Seems that these two types of predators are sharing lots of uh, prey items together. And uh, we are finally getting to the herbivory, to the lower trophic escape. The graph is not showing too much because the lines are overlapping, but again, uh, the, there is no significant uh, effect, a bit difference between the treatments by uh, ants in comparison to control. But when the predators, vertebrate predators and all predators are missing, the herbivory increases significantly. And it, it increases actually usually by 40 to 70%. And the total herbivory is typically around 3 to 4 percent at the lowest elevational study sites and about 2.5 percent uh, at the highest elevational study site. And uh, it increases more at the elevations, uh, lower elevations. Again, the overall herbivory was slightly lower at the dry season than in the wet season. These results are uh, quite in line with what was expected and what is known about the levels of the herbivory. The previous studies by Anstad, Schlinkert, and Kozlov found that the herbivory ranges between 3 or 1% uh, percent in some uh, specific habitats, but the Kozlov did the global study where he found the uh, mean herbivory to be 7.6% and the highest herbivory in the temperate and lower the, uh, herbivory in the tropical study sites. So this matches our results. Uh, but I was thinking whether this level of herbivory is actually significant for the plants. And there have been studies which are showing that the 5% herbivory is actually transferring into the decrease of the productivity of the plants by up to 25%. Uh, Schlinkert also observed that the 1% herbivory change translates into 10% lower abundance of the fruits, uh, sorry, flowers in the future years. So despite the change from the 2.3, uh, 2.5 to maybe 4% is not significant, like significantly, it might be still ecologically important for the plants because every bite, uh, bite uh, counts. And as I was saying, uh, there is a very close interplay between the top-down and bottom-up control. So I would like to bring it now to the case of the study of Ficus aliana, which is the Ficus, which is the most uh, abundant and uh, most abundant ficus along the elevational gradient and spanning the low, longest uh, range from 200 meters above to 2,700 meters above sea level. In the first graph, you can see how the herbivory looks like on the ficus haliana normally. These are the control saplings. The herbivory decreases with the increasing elevation. Uh, my another student, Anya, was uh, doing the study where she was trying to induce the ficus aliana, and she was more successful in the lowlands than at the higher elevations. So here we see that maybe the plant species specifically can be dependent more on the induced uh, defenses in lowlands than in the highlands. This goes well in line with another study which we conducted with Martin Wolf 
and he found that the constitutive defenses of this specific plant species is actually higher in the uh, higher elevations. So altogether, considering that the plant, the Picosaliana, can be defended more into inducible defenses in the lowlands and the constitutive defenses in the highlands, we would expect the bigger difference between the control and exclusion treatments in the lowlands. And that's what we did. And this is what we exactly observed. Uh, despite the absolute change is not a big, uh, very big, the difference between the control and exclosure is really way bigger in the lowlands, which means that the plant species it is dependent more on the help of predators is in lowlands than at the higher elevation. So uh, then we continued like that uh, with the other plant species, and we found that in most cases, the plant had stronger constitutive defenses uh, where the biomass was expensive at the cooler parts of the gradient, but they relied more on the defenses uh, through the induced defenses in the lowlands. So we can conclude that the predation by vertebrates decreases with the increasing elevation, we don't see big effect of ants, but that's because they are eating only herbivores. And there are the spiders who are fitting in and taking over. Thus, the overall effect of the ants might not be detectable. So overall, the predation by the herbivore of ants is actually bigger than the effect of the uh, vertebrate predators on the herbivory sometimes. And uh, so the birds, again, vertebrate predators are feeding on both predators, herbivores at the same time, keeping the ratios in balance. So there is a very uh, complex interplay between the top-down and bottom-up control, which works on the basis of individual plant species. And the overall cascade, whether the cascade will be there or not, depends on the composition of the plant species, the plant species which we select for the uh, exposure experiment, and really the vertebrates, especially birds, seems to be the most effective uh, predators. Uh, as for the ants, both from the review and from our experiments, we found it, their, their effect is dependent on the length of the experiment. The longer the experiment was, surprisingly, the smaller the effect was, which means that the spiders obviously were taking some time to fit in and uh, decrease the effect of the ants by themselves, while when the experiment was very short, up to one month, we typically found a very significant effect of the ants' exposure. But uh, this is what I was doing so far in the forest uh, understories. And what really uh, made me kind of angry and curious is that most of the predators and uh, most of the trophic cascades are actually expected in the forest canopies. And I could not reach them because I had no way how to get there. It, was, it would be very complicated. And that's why I designed the next experiment where I started to use the canopy cranes. And I tried to replicate the same experiments uh, at several canopy crane sites. Uh, I was doing exactly the same treatments, uh, again, aiming to exclude birds and but separately at some strata, uh, six treatments in total. And there is actually quite a handy uh, network of the cranes. And I was so far finishing my experiment in uh, Tomakomai in Japan. Uh, I finished partly in uh, Bupeng in China, but from there we didn't manage to export the insects, so we have only the final results on the herbivory. Uh, we worked, uh, we are still working in uh, Kakoba crane in Papua New Guinea, and we finished successfully full one year long experiment at both Australian cranes in uh, DRAW, Drain, Drain Tree uh, Research Observatory, Rainforest Observatory, and at Uke Face in Sydney. Uh, because the Lambert Hills crane was uh, closed in the meantime, and we still wanted to continue our research, but could not go to the tropical sites anymore, we decided to replace it by the Leipzig canopy crane, uh, because it has a similar uh, Commun plant communities as the Tomakomai, 
and is accessible, accessible to us during these difficult and challenging COVID times. So this project is uh, still under the way. I will sh see, uh, show you only the partial results. But uh, to start with, we needed to uh, standardize the plants phylogenetically. So we selected from uh, different families uh, specific plant species on which we work. And then we started to exclude the predators from them. We needed to consider also their abundances because we need 70 individuals of them and at least 12 individuals of them within the arm of the crane, which is sometimes a big challenge. And uh, so far, as I said, the project is still ongoing. Uh, we work with 720 saplings at each of the study site and about uh, 350 branches at the canopy. And we so far used uh, 55,000 kilometers of PVC pipes, which we shift, uh, shipped to the sites from either China or from Czech Republic. 200 kilo of tango glue, which we uh, glued on the trees. And we have got several nice hundreds of thousands of insects, which we continue to identify. Uh, I'm still pretty fast, so uh, still uh, enough time there. So uh, I would like to mention that uh, we started the experiment again with the work on the plasticine caterpillars. I just like it. Uh, and I was always again wondering whether it works or not. So at each of these study sites, we exposed uh, 6,000 caterpillars in the forest understory and forest canopy, and we observed who predated it. Here is the total predation, and you can see very interesting results, which I totally didn't expect, but we detected the higher predation uh, in canopy only at the sites which are temperate or like nearly temperate in Tomakomai, and uke phase. And actually I see I have here old uh, picture. We have also now new results from last month from Leipzig and there the results are exactly the same as in Tomakomai. So three study sites where we have higher herbivore uh, predation on caterpillars in the canopy. And then we have got the three tropical study sites where the predation by, uh, on plasticine caterpillars were ex was actually higher in the understory. I didn't expect that, I have to say, but uh, I will uh, keep the reasons and the explanations for the publication, which should be coming out soon. But uh, it correlates well with the abundances of the arthropods and the predators which we are observing there. And as we uh, knew a bit about what kind of predators we are dealing with, uh, what we could expect on individual plant species, what are the defenses, is we started again to exclude the predators. Uh, as you might expect uh, from the predation on the plasticine caterpillars, we had to kind of zoom in when we were looking at the results from the understory. In the understory, the overall predation uh, and the effect of predators was very low in the understory. But when we zoom in, we can see the control. Nothing was done to the saplings. No, uh, like roughly 10 individuals of the arthropods in on meter square of the foliage. But when we excluded the predators, uh, ends again, nothing happened as in our previous experiments. And then when the birds, and bats were excluded, the abundances actually increased significantly, but the highest abundances we observed when both of these predators were absent. What was happening in the forest canopy was rather striking, not that we increased the abundances by five individuals per meter square, but by actually 140 individuals of the insects per meter square. Especially when all the predators were gone from the forest canopy, the jump was significant. But again, uh, despite there was many ants in the canopy, uh, they didn't do anything with the arthropod communities. Uh, here, my student uh, prepared me today a very uh, basic graph, which is actually showing some details of what is happening in there. We found quite interesting uh, difference between which groups of the arthropods are where. We actually found uh, many more beetles in the canopy than in the understory, but 
more caterpillars, Lepidopterella larvae feeding on the understory than in the canopy. So overall, there was more uh, caterpillars than beetles, and there was there were mostly caterpillars in the forest understory. So if you can imagine it like this, many caterpillars here in the understory, only a few of them up there in the canopy. Quite many beetles in the canopy, but only a few in the understory. But uh, when we are considering what kind of damage they could cause to the plants, we have to remember not, not, all, not all the beetles are actually herbivores. We still will have to do uh, some final work and identify to which kill they're uh, belonging. But uh, what do you think? Where there is more birds? Uh, is there more birds in the canopy or in the understory? I will reveal it now to you. There is actually uh, 30 kilo of insectivorous birds in the forest canopy versus five kilo for the same area of the insectivorous birds per in the understory, which goes pretty well again together. There is more predators, thus there is uh, very few insects living in the understory and the caterpillars are kind of hiding in the understory and surviving and avoiding the predation pressure, which is way higher in the canopy. This has the direct consequences for the herbivory, of course. And this is the, actually the last slide, which uh, I would like to show you today. This is the herbivory from Tomakomai, and uh, it's quite messy, uh, but uh, you can see here the treatments, individual plant species, which we were working with, and then the canopy and understory. The biggest variability of the herbivorous damage by, was explained by the plant species, which means by the bottom-up control. Whether the plant is very yummy or very, very poisonous to arthropods is determining how big herbivory it will be suffering. So there is a Australia japonica, which is eaten well, but there is a magnolia, which is not eaten at all. After that, the second variable explaining the variability is the strata. The canopy, uh, canopy trees of the same species are always eaten less than the saplings in the, uh, in the understory. Yeah, understory herbivory is higher than in the canopy, of course. And only after that, the effect of the predators could be detectable as the third important factor. Here it's uh, again a uh, quite detectable uh, difference between, uh, like no detectable difference between the actions of the predators uh, and ants versus control, but then the herbivory increases if the vertebrate predators and all predators are missing from the study system. So uh, similarly, as we were seeing before in the, uh, in the previous experiments, there is a very tight interplay between the bottom up and top down control. And it very much depends on the natural abundances of the arthropods and on the abundances of the predators, which we can detect at each of the study sites. Uh, we will continue the work on the more tropical study site in Australia, uh, where we are finishing soon. So if you would like to follow our research, we will be very happy to hear from you. And I hope that I showed you today that uh, these uh, trophic cascades are quite complex, could be detectable and dependent on one plant species, but cannot be um, sometimes cannot be detected as the, in the whole population because the effect is hidden uh, based on what kind of plant species is presented in the experiment. So quite difficult to detect them. And uh, with this, I would like to acknowledge to acknowledge all uh, assistants who helped us in the field, who finished the experiments for us in Australia, especially when we were not able to get there on time due to COVID and they send us all the samples. And also to all my students who work hard on identifications of the arthropods which we are collecting and also on the analysis of the herbivory, which is a tedious work. And thank you very much for your attention.
Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely fascinating. Really, really, really interesting. Uh, let's stop sharing the screen. Great. Yes. And uh, and I will invite everyone to ask questions and also uh, do switch on your camera if you're comfortable with that. But nice to have a, a visible audience for the for the Q and A session. Uh, and uh, we can ask questions. Uh, great. But thank you. Really, really, really clear and uh, lots of really fascinating new insights and quite a few surprises there as well I thought. Yeah, also uh, for me. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I'll open the floor to questions, if anybody has any. Uh, while we're waiting, I, I, I'll kick off with one. Uh, I think it was the end, of, I think it was from Tomokomai, you were showing a result where in the canopy, when you excluded all predators, you had a really big effect on arthropods. But when you just excluded birds, it was quite a modest effect. Uh, I remember. Does that mean it's the bats that are, are really dumped, uh, affecting that process, or am I misunderstanding? That there, there, is, uh, there is actually many bats, but uh, that was that that was one of those surprising uh, surprising uh, results because the ants by themselves didn't have uh, any effect, and then when I excluded ants and the vertebrates together, the effect kind of increased in comparison to uh, to the vertebrates. So there might be actually also some uh, methodological issues uh, where, because there was many uh, aphids and uh, they seem to be uh, like uh, playing a lot with the da data, but uh, simply like, oh yeah. The another thing is that in the cages where the ants were missing, there was uh, many hymenoptera larvae at the time which were just hatching from the eggs. So there were uh, branches where there was uh, hundreds of them and they draw the results too much. So I think maybe because the birds are not affecting, uh, effective in eating the small eggs, but ants are, the ants, just because of the timing, because the ants were not there, the eggs hatched and there were just these tiny, tiny things which were still not eaten by the birds, would not be eaten by the birds at the time, but were caused by the absence of the ants. Okay. Yeah, it, sometimes I feel that the uh, abundances of the arthropods results are very dependent on what time exactly we go there. Not only we, of course, aim for the nice weather, but we can go one week later, one week earlier, and we catch completely different phenology. That's why we try to replicate this experiment several times, several seasons to get the proper picture. And then any one sampling time, how long was your period? Was it a few weeks or one week? No, uh, no. this was like in the temperate study sites is the full season. Okay, and okay. in the in the tropics, it's six and six months, like full okay, year. It's quite a long period. So. It's a long period. Uh, for Tomakomai, it's quite short because the leaves appear the first the last week of April, and they are actually dropping in the late August. So there is a few months, but we can't go further because then we would not find the leaves with the numbers anymore. So we do the max. <laughs> Uh, and then other study sites, we try to uh, match it more or less like five, five, six months. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Anybody else got a question? I have seen here one in the chat. Oh, yes. Uh, so, Xiang, do you want to ask your question directly? Yeah. Uh, uh, how many leaf uh, samples per plant are you? Taking because I also work with this herbivory with uh, my Brazilian uh, colleague and also working with uh, uh, Dr. Will from uh, US. This uh, herbivory variability work. So, how many how many leaf you are uh, leaf sample per plant is calculated uh, using for the calculate calcul uh, estimating the herbivory? Uh, we do 30, uh, 30 leaves per sapling or per branch. Okay, and there is there is some kind of you are collecting randomly, or there is just some kind of the protocol. No, there is a, so we pick a, a randomly a, a selected branch, which uh, of course like we just uh, look at it and pick the one which very likely will not uh, be disturbed by the treatment, mm -hmm. and from that uh, branch we uh, we we select three like that. And from each of these three, we uh, mark first 10 leaves from the top. And then we tie a string. Yeah. So, because sometimes the permanent marker gets washed. 
So we know where the 10 leaves finished. And uh, after that, we calculate uh, the herbivory on these 10 numbers leaves, uh, 10 numbered leaves, and we calculate also those leaves which grew above uh, the leaf where we started. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. So it's like 30 leaves per sapling by 760 saplings in the understory. Everything six times uh, it accumulates. Yeah, we recently was, uh, like uh, have collected this tropical tree herbivory uh, that paper published in uh, uh, like ecology. Uh, mm -hmm. So the data paper we have we published and maybe we will calculate. So it is all about. So we took off our lowest branch. Uh, from the distance we mark and then we calculate the herbivory from bottom take a branch from bottom one two three four five six like that mm -hmm. and take up 50 leaves uh, if there is no branch uh, no 50 leaf in one branch then we take a neighborhood branch and uh, so to reduce the biasness for the herbivory exactly like in, in the previous study which i was showing by marketa tahadlova there was 50 leaves yeah. but simply because we never fit 50 leaves into one small branch and uh, it will be nearly double of the amount which we have, which is obviously not feasible for us nearly to analyze. Then we had to stick it uh, to 30, which is still uh, representative uh, based on our previous results. So. so are you using some kind of the app or the image? No, or... no, no. The, the app is unfortunately not useful for us because we do it quite in detail. Uh, at some of the study sites, we try to distinguish the herbivory by minors and by chores. So we are using manual work, <laughs> many students laboring in Photoshop yeah. and an image J. Yeah, mm -hmm. I also work on a major too, with much easier. Yeah. It's just to follow up on that, I was gonna ask a question about that. So you're, you're scanning the leaves for lost leaf area and yes. then for the minors and gold feeders, you just is it by area you're quantifying or just the number of counts that you have of those? Uh, no, we um, kind of mark the area which is visibly either it's a goal which usually doesn't, sometimes it makes like that yellowish patch around. So yeah. that's what we mark as the herbivorous damage, but of course it's sucking through the leaf so it can be quantified. But uh, because we have got another student who is specifically focused on the goals, then we have got also the goals and the diversity of the goals and the abundances per leaf, abundances per branch. So this all could be added to the herbivorous image. Yeah, okay. That's it. And so uh, I guess one part that gets missed is sap feeders, sap feeding, I suppose, and those components. What, uh, what fraction of the total herbivory do you think you're, you capture with your methods? And are, are there some uh, elements that are inevitably missed because they're harder to quantify? No, actually, I, I don't know. That's a very good question. How much we are un underestimating here? Yeah. Uh, definitely, uh, and unfortunately, it will be very different from side to side because there was many more uh, aphids in Tomakomai than elsewhere. And there was many more goals in uh, Sydney than anywhere else. So these are total two extremes, uh, which we could record where the herbivory, we are obviously missing a lot. Right, mm. interesting. Uh, okay, Owen, question. Hi, uh, thanks Katrina. Uh, really, really nice talk, amazing data sets, especially when you have Thank to you. Measure, measure all of the herbivory on marked leaves. So I have one question related to that, and then if I can ask a cheeky second question as well. So yeah. is there ever a case for assessing herbivory using standard uh, measure, standing herbivory, so just doing like a snapshot survey, or is that, because that's obviously a lot quicker and easier, Yes. is that always going to uh, be problematic, do you think? Uh, before I was using that, <laughs> but... Uh... In the earlier experiment, but when I didn't mark the leaves yet, it actually happened to me that you know I collected the leaves at the beginning, then I collected other leaves in the at the end, and the herbivory was totally off, like very different. So we decided that to get the exact number, we really need to follow the leaf. Also, uh, because yeah, because the leaves are dropping, and we uh, it's 
sometimes the whole uh, leaf disappears and we don't know, but from the branch when the leaves are marked, we can kind of estimate whether the stalk is still there, whether it was completely eaten or not. So it's quite tricky. Yeah, I, I would like, from a few years ago, I started to do only the rate of the herbivory, but I understand that the standing herbivory is much easier. Okay, thank you. And, and then my follow-up, so, so you talked a little bit about um, m potentially missing some herbivore categories like the sap suckers and presumably mm -hmm. background herb herbivory also could be a significant factor. Um, on the predation side or the natural enemies, I guess parasitoids are an obvious category of natural yeah. enemy that might um, induce top-down trophic cascades. Do you have any idea whether they're showing congruent patterns in terms of their impact uh, to the um, to the insect predators and the vertebrate predators with uh, elevation latitude um, stratum? This is a very good question, and there is a, a symphony uh, who is specifically working on this uh, for me, but because the work is very slow, uh, he has no results yet. But all the caterpillars which we are collecting, he is uh, from Tomakumai, he dissected them and searched for the parasitoids, the other sites are being sequenced, and he is searching for the pattern in there. And so we have the caterpillars for treatments and caterpillars from the control branches are hoping to see if there is some difference, whether the uh, caterpillars have bigger, maybe chances to survive somewhere, but so far he's in the way like sending the caterpillars, parasitoids to the bolt. Uh, no, I can't say more about this currently. I hope he will get faster. <laughs> Great, thank you. That's an incredibly painstaking work. Okay, there's a question from Charlie that I'll read out. Uh, just to clarify, you believe that canopy arthropod abundances are lower than understory, in the, an understory primarily due to predation pressure. Did you take any measurements for microclimatic metrics, as this would also seem to be important, particularly in the tropics? Uh, yeah, I actually immediately recalled uh, it's it simply uh, it doesn't have to be because of the predation, of course. Uh, there are many things which are making the under uh, canopies very disgusting for the arthropod to live. Uh, there is a strong wind, there is the lot of radiation, and uh, the we as we are working on the edges of the canopies, we can't with, get with the cages into the canopy, of course, the, and also the crane can't get uh, us in. So we might be missing some part of the variable there because the, of the wind and of this radiation, the arthropods might be living a little bit more inside in the canopy while we are working outside at the edges. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but outside on the canopy, it might be exactly because of the, because of the climatic uh, variables also. And we are uh, getting them in the standardized way from the cranes all of them are measuring somehow the wind speed, the radiation, temperature every five meters. So this is what we will be incorporating later on. Mm -hmm. Also, one thing I completely forgot to mention, we are collecting all the leaves, which we uh, are working with at the end. We, uh, together with Yuhapeka Salminen, we are analyzing the polyphenols, uh, alkaloids, and oxidative activity of these leaves, both in understory and in the canopy and the students are measuring the length and density of the trichomes and CN ratio. So uh, these factors will be incorporated in and hopefully they will explain the significant part of where the arthropods are and where they are not. Yeah. I imagine the, the, as Charlie suggests, the radiation pressure is stronger in the tropics and the, yeah. uh, the wind and maybe a stronger temperature. Do you, do you see stronger can, stratum contrast in the tropics or in the temperate sites? I don't remember what, what you showed. Strong, uh, uh, very strong in the in the temperate. Okay, right. Yes. The, no, no, very strong. Uh, Generally, similar similar uh, responses in the canopy understory in tropics, but very big differences in the temperate. Okay, so there's a stronger temperate effect. I would suggest yeah. radiation isn't isn't probably the main factor. It could be wind or other things. Uh, okay, 
so a couple more questions. Okay, Kate. Hi, uh, hi, Katrina. That was brilliant. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really nice to hear about it, and I totally appreciate the amount of work involved in all of that. Um, and so you've got these uh, lovely canopy sites, and you showed us the Japanese data, which is kind of more as a temperate site. Yes, not yes. Tropical. So, what are you expecting uh, in terms of a tropical temperate contrast overall? Uh, predicting so, and why? Uh, what, what, what I see is that the abundances, the changes in the abundances of arthropods naturally are not so big between the canopy and understory in the tropics. But there is way more uh, insectivorous birds living in the forest understories. Uh, which might be causing the some effect. Uh, at the same time, there is many more ants in the tropical canopies than in the temperate canopies. Yeah. So either there will be very tight interplay where these uh, types of the predators will somehow um, sh share and the overall effect will be uh, nothing, simply the birds taking more in the other story and uh, uh, ants more in the canopy. Or yeah, I actually do not expect big, big vertical uh, trend in the uh, in the tropics. Maybe. Do you expect? Yeah. So yeah, you, you're sort of expecting it to be different than to what you've got here. Really quite different. Yes, quite quite different mm -hmm. from. Uh, that's what we I can already see. It's quite different for many taxa. It actually opposite to what we have seen in Tomakomai. Yeah, and then when we suppress the ants in the canopy we got really big increases in the uh, invertebrates in the tree. Yes, the uh, I feel the same. I, yeah. I, I exactly like this. This is what seems to be visible uh, visible there despite we didn't run the analysis on it yet. Brilliant, thank you. Did I miss it? Why, why do you think there are, there's more, uh, well, why is there more bird predation in the other story in the tropics? What's, uh, this is simply a physiological thing because uh, the insectivorous birds in the tropics might be more adapted to the in forest interior. And many of these insectivorous are really small birds. Uh, like if I recall this uh, Papuan side, there is many of these cericornises, flycatchers, which are in the forest uh, understory. Those birds which are under in the canopy are mostly bigger. Uh, partly frugivorous going after the fruits, nectars, and taking the insect only occasionally as a part of the diet when feeding the chicks. So uh, overall, I feel the bigger pressure in understory in tropics. Mm -hmm. okay. And Vivek? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, Katrina, for this uh, um, insightful presentation. I'm a, a researcher working in MS Swaminathan Research Foundation in India. Uh, I work among small farmers. Uh, so uh, we have uh, uh, research sites uh, across the altitudinal gradients also. I was just wondering, uh, um, is it too early or are there any uh, insights that uh, uh, agriculture systems could gather from your uh, study about forests? Uh, are related to herbivory and predator, predator uh, and these kind of uh, gills. Um, so th that is my first question. And uh, uh, my second question is, uh, um, are there any uh, citizen science or community science uh, tools being developed uh, 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 to assess the process like predation um, so that uh, uh, there is possibility for uh, many people to participate from underdeveloped and uh, developing countries also through apps like iNaturalist. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Uh, that is actually a pretty cool uh, question, the second one. Unfortunately, I don't think that's something, uh, it's very sad to say, but nothing no, nothing useful could actually uh, come from, from my study because the diversity is so big and despite we have got tens, uh, hundreds of thousands of insects. Uh, there is nothing like detectable outbreak or uh, like really abundant thing which could be considered as being uh, important for the like pest uh, or like agricultural work. Uh, because also we work in very nature, we try to work in the very natural, not agricultural uh, habitats. 
And uh, as for the questions, we are actually dreaming about that. <laughs> we don't have the app, but uh, one of my uh, later, uh, a little bit older PhD student is actually uh, thinking to expand a similar project with uh, Bastien Castanero, who has got this prediction project across the whole Europe on the Oaks. And they are thinking to, this is a very nice citizen project, but unfortunately only in Europe and focusing on predation. So they try to get wider. Uh, hopefully it will get through some funding, <laughs> but so far no, no app available. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thank uh, you. Elena? Elena? Oh, yeah. Okay, thanks for the really nice talk. Uh, I want to kind of change a bit things. So I was like, interested in the spiders that you mentioned in the beginning of your talk. Mm -hmm. So because I, I've been in Papua New Guinea and I've seen that there's all kinds of spiders. So yeah. do you know anything about the spiders that the birds like? So do they eat more of the small spiders or bigger spiders or poisonous spiders or non-poisonous spiders? Or they eat relatively small spiders around uh, seven millimeters big spiders. We didn't get detect any big spiders. They mostly eat the spiders which are on the foliage. They get them from the gleaning, not the web making spiders too much. And yeah, the results are quite nice. I like it. I was actually a bit worried when we put the exclosures and the cages, then there will be many spiders getting in because they will use the cage construction as the place where to put the webs but fortunately it was not happening at all so they were really those spiders which are eaten a lot as we see from the diet were actually really increasing their abundances in the in the exclusions yeah thank you thanks and uh, i think i missed i must have missed this in your methods how are you excluding ants what's your protocol for uh that's the tangled loop uh, the sticky barrier, which we apply either on the trunk or on the branches. Okay, I see. Yeah, so unfortunately, that's uh, also limiting any other crawling uh, arthropods, which could just <laughs> get glued there. And yes. in the canopy, it also gets washed away. <laughs> so it needs to be uh, checked from time to time. We were thinking we were also making some protective layers, how to how to prevent the rain. So it was a bit tricky. Yes. Uh, yeah, but that's Tango Blue. Okay, uh, great. Uh, any more questions? Any? If not, uh, I, I think we can draw to a close. I encourage you in, in our seminar tradition, we uh, to unmute your microphone and give an audible round of, round of applause to our, our speaker today. So thank you very much, uh, Katrina. That was absolutely fascinating. There's lots to think about. And I, I look forward to seeing the papers and the studies emerge on the new site. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, great, and as I will record this, I'll post it onto YouTube later today, and, uh, and uh, feel free to share and, and circulate widely to those who couldn't be here. And hope to see some of you next week at uh, Sandra Diaz's uh, seminar at uh, 4, 4 p.m. same time next week. So thank you, Katrina. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for invitation, Bye. and have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.